Hello and welcome back. The fog came in and it got very cold. I had to run the pellet stove today. But today I wanted to do a word study. I tried to get away from the fighting that's going on between the Godhead and the Trinity. I believe in the Godhead. But with one of my studies about the Godhead um, and the Trinity being false, I came across a word that, I, that God just put it in my heart. Hey, let's do a word study on it. And the word is conscience. So we will be mentioning the Godhead uh, versus the Trinity in here, but mostly just about your conscience. What can it do and what can become of your conscience? Now, one of the false things that I've always done that always gets you into trouble is you say terms that are not found in the Bible because of man's tradition. Well, we've always said it. Now, conscience is in the Bible, and kill, the word kill is in the Bible. But if you ever heard someone say you can kill your conscience, well, with this study, you'll find out that's not true. You cannot kill your conscience. So I'm going to give you the list of what can happen to your conscience, and then we're going to go through the Word of God, and I'm going to give you the definition of conscience. Excuse me. Let me move this out over here. I get dry in case I need water. Um, I have 13. They could have been shrunk down, or they could have been longer, but I just wanted to be specific. So, number one, your conscience can, be, can convict you. Number two, your conscience can offend God and man. So your conscience can offend, be offensive. Number three, your conscience can bear witness, can be a witness. Four, your conscience can be good, strong. Good as opposed to evil, strong as opposed to weak. So you're, when it says your conscience is good, it's saying it's right and it's strong. It comes through clear, you can hear it. Number five, your conscience can become weak, the opposite of strong. Your conscience, number six, your conscience can be pure. Okay. Number seven, because when it becomes so weak, your conscience can become defiled. Number eight, your conscience can have a testimony. Get a load of that one. Number nine, your conscience can be seared, damaged, scarred. Okay. Number ten, your conscience cannot be perfect. Pure and perfect are two different words, and we'll explain that. The law of sin and death oh, uh, for that definition of what can happen. Your conscience cannot be perfect. Law of sin and death. Old Testament hell or Abraham's bosom. This is going to be, when we get into the Bible, a reference to the Old Testament. Uh, number 11. Your conscience can be purged from the law of sin and death. New Testament. Uh, the blood of Jesus Christ. And you get to go to heaven. Number 12. Your conscience can be evil. And I think that's the one that people get confused and say you can kill your conscience. No, your conscience can become evil. Instead of telling you that's wrong, your conscience is going to tell you that's right. There's nothing wrong with that. The Bible says there's, it's wrong, but your conscience is going to get evil and say, there's nothing wrong with it. Go for it. And last, your conscience can shame evildoers. It can shame people, your conscience can. So, it's going to be an interesting study, and I, I love doing studies. Lately, I've been really getting into doing studies. So, the definition of conscience. Okay. The two that are the big ones we're looking at. Number one, eternal or self-knowledge, or judgment of right and wrong, or the faculty, power, or principle within us, which decides on the lawfulness or unlawfulness of our own actions and affections and instantly approves or condemns them. Uh, that's okay. No, that's not okay. Eh, you need to look into that to see if that's okay. You get that feeling that something's not right, you need to look into that. So that's the main term for conscience. But as I was reading down through some of the uh, definitions, another two is, of conscience is knowledge of own actions or thoughts. Okay. 
Uh, remember the list of definitions that I told about bearing witness, uh, testifying. Right? And another one is knowledge of the actions of others. Your conscience can bear witness and you can see other people. You get vexed by this lost world okay? because you have the knowledge of the actions of others. So, let's get started. We are going to start in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 9. This is a story a lot of people know, and when you come across a story, you're like, I know that story, you get excited. So, we're actually going to start at verse 3, but verse 9 is what has the word conscience in it, but we're going to start at verse 3, and we're going to read. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. They're always trying to get Jesus in trouble. But Jesus is smarter than them every time. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Sometimes you got to ignore people at first. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Sometimes people are just going to pest you and pest you and you're going to answer, have to answer them. He who is without sin cast the first stone. Cast the first, cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they, this chapter, verse 9, and they which heard it became convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Okay. Two things. Remember our list. It, your conscience can convict you. Notice what it says here. It says convict, in verse 9, convicted by their own conscience. Your conscience cannot convict somebody else's conscience. It can't. Your conscience can only convict you. Now we'll find out later that your conscience can spark a reaction from other people. But your conscience can only convict you. Okay? You can't stop somebody else from falling into sin and temptation. And we're going to keep reading uh, the next two for a reason. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. I had to throw those two verses in there. It wasn't that all oh, your sins are forgiven so you can go back out and sin again. No. Go and sin no more. You're to strive not to sin. But in here, your conscience can convict you. And remember, only you. Your conscience cannot convict somebody else. We're going to go to Acts 23, 1 is our next verse. Book of Acts. And you'll notice we didn't start in the Old Testament. Why? Because conscience is, a new t is uh, in the book of collections of New Testaments. Uh, the book of John was the only time it was in, tech it was in the Old Testament because Jesus hadn't died. But that's only one time in the Old Testament. Most of the time it's in the New Testament. Acts 23. Okay. Acts 23, verse 1 is what has the verse in it that has the word conscience. But chapter 22, if you read through it, the Apostle Paul, um, and this might have been uh, 20, uh, 22, 21 might talk about how he was taken, but 20. Two talks about Paul explains his life before he got saved, uh, before the road to Damascus, uh, who he was before the changed life afterwards, and preaching Jesus to the crowd that's wanting to kill him. And the soldiers grabbed him and brought him in. 
Now, if you go to verse 30 of 22, it talks about how, see, on the morrow, because he would have known the certainty wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. So that's where we're at. Paul is standing before the priests, the chief priests, and the council. Okay. Verse 1, And Paul, after all this happened, him talking and everything about his testimony and trying to preach Jesus to the crowd, And Paul earnestly behold the council and said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. He was not going to back down. He's going to preach the word, and he didn't care about the cost. His conscience was good. And remember what we talked about, one of the things about conscience, good, was right. His, he was right with the Lord, preaching Jesus Christ to the crowd. Uh, and he also had strong conscience, almost like courage to do it. It took courage to stand up to that crowd. Okay. So your conscience can be good. It can be right with God, and it can be strong. You know, give you strength to be courageous and listen to your conscience and stand by your conscience. Let's go to Acts 24, 16. Next one, Acts 24, just stump over, 16. Are we going to start at 16? Nope, we're going to start at verse 11 and read through. Because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raised up the people, neither in the synagogues, nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they now accuse me. Remember, they grabbed him when he was uh, not doing any of these things. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Remember, he was uh, had a good conscience until this day boldly preaching right here what they call heresy so worship I the God of my fathers 15 and have hope towards God which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead both of the just and the unjust and right there real quick I gotta say this we were in 23 but if you continued in 23 the last verse we were at that had conscience, he realizes that there's Pharisees and Sadducees, and Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, the Pharisees do, and he saw that and he used that. He said that, I'm here because I believe in the resurrection. So that's why he, he restates it here, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Verse 16, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God, and towards men. Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, that's where they grabbed him, neither with multitude nor with tumult. But we go back to verse 16. Notice what it says there. He exercised my, I exercised myself to have always a conscience Void of offense towards God and towards men. Remember, it's an exercise. It's an ongoing. You got to keep your conscience strong. You know, by studying the Word of God, the do's and the don'ts, understanding what sin is. So we learn here that if he tries to avoid offending, offending God, then that must mean that your conscience can offend God. Okay. When you ignore your conscience and you fall into sin and then you ignore the Holy Spirit that convicts you saying you better repent, it offends God and God will chasten you. Okay. But what he's saying here is, if you look back in 14, I confess unto thee after the way which they call heresy, so, I worsh so worship I the God of my fathers. He's not offending God because they're saying he's worshiping a different God. He's not offending God. He's worshiping the same God in the Old Testament 
is that it's in the New Testament. Jesus Christ is God fully. So he's saying he's not offending God, but it must be possible to offend God. He also says here, and towards men. Okay. Did you know that you are to strive that your intent is not to offend people? You're not to do things to purposely offend people. And I've noticed this a lot lately. People are doing pictures and people are doing this and that. You are to strive to not purposely offend people. But let me let you in on something. When you preach truth and you stand for truth and your conscience stands its ground, you are going to offend people. But your intention should never be I'm going to do this purposely just so I can offend them. Now you hear me say sometimes that if you want to get them mad, I'm not saying I want them to be mad, so let me rephrase it. I'm saying just simply preaching the gospel gets them mad. I don't want to be drawn into the fight. I don't want to be drawn into the debate and the arguing with lost people when it comes to the Word of God. But when you preach truth, you're going to offend people. So here we see that was on the list that your conscience can offend God, it can offend people. Okay. Next on the list, 24, we're on Romans chapter 2. And thank you Lord for showing me this. Romans chapter 2, verse 15 has the word in it, but we're going to start in 14 and go to 15, uh, 16. So we're going to start at 14. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are not are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. I have that one highlighted. Their conscience, there's our word, also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile causing or else exclusion, excusing, excusing one another. Remember the verse we said, telling you, okay, that's okay, that's not. That's okay, that's not. In the day when God shall judge, verse 16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now here we see that was on the list that your conscience can bear witness. Now, I didn't write this down, but the verse, and somebody can write it in the comments for me, or I'll put it across the screen. The laws of God are written on everyone's heart, but the laws are a schoolmaster. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So your conscience bears witness to the law. And here I believe it's talking about, it's supposed to bear witness to let you know that you can't keep the law. Okay? You cannot keep the law. And your conscience is going to bear witness to say, hey, you did that and you weren't supposed to. You did that. There's just something wrong. You know, your life is not right. There's something wrong. You're pretty messed up. You're not good. You can't be good. You can't try to be good because you'll always fail. You can't keep the law. And it's a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So we see here that your conscience can bear witness. Mm -hmm. My conscience, when your loss bears witness to the law, when you get saved, your conscience bears witness to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. It's not about keeping the law. You realize you're no good, you're on your way to hell, and you, go, and you fall on your knees and say, Lord, I'm so sorry for sinning against you. I can't keep the law. I can't be good. I can't earn my way to heaven. Once you do that and believe in Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and call upon the name of the Lord to save you, your conscience bears witness to this, God's perfect written word, with the Holy Spirit, and we'll find that out later, uh, bear witness in the Holy Spirit. I always keep saying with on accident, in the Holy Spirit. So here we see your conscience can bear witness. Notice we haven't come across anything yet that says you can kill your conscience. That's something I gotta get out of my vocabulary. So, Romans 9, 
verse 1. So we're going to jump ahead a little bit. I always say the verse that it comes in, but we're going to read verse 1 through 5. So Romans 9, verse 1 through 5. I say the truth in Christ I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, saved, only for the saved that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promise. Okay. Now, Paul here still has a great love for the, Christ, uh, for the Jewish people, his kindred. And his conscience is bearing witness in the Holy Ghost that he wants them to get saved. And if he could, let's see, if I could wish myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren's sake, if he could, he can't do it, but if he could die to save them, he would. But the only person who could save them is Jesus Christ. But he has such conscience within the Holy Ghost. And if you remember other passages where Jesus, where God is saying, his will is that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. The Holy Spirit is bearing, is, his conscience is bearing witness in the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit is like, yeah, I don't want him to go to hell either. I don't want him to go to hell. But they have to choose me. God's like, they have to do what the Bible says. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. They refuse to do that, they're going to hell. But God's wish is not any go to, uh, that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Perish? Hell. Repentance. Hmm. So repentance is part of salvation. It takes faith to repent. So here we see that not only when you're lost, your conscience can bear witness with the laws that are written in your heart. When you get saved, your conscience is now going to bear witness in the Holy Ghost. He's going to open this book to you. He's going to tell you, when you find out, hey, you know, the sanctification, you find out something in your house that I've come across, I think I've said this before, I've come across a little tray that looked like a plate, and I got it from Thailand. And then, all of a sudden, I kept walking by and just something started eating at me. And I realized there was false gods on it. Then I realized it was an ashtray for cigarettes. And I got it as like a souvenir. And we're not supposed to have false gods in your home. You know, no God but the one God. Mm -hmm. So I got convicted by the Holy Spirit because I walked by and I couldn't figure it out. What's wrong with it? And finally someday I sat down, I picked it up after doing some Bible studies. And I'm like, you know what? This is an ashtray. Our body is the temple for the Holy Ghost. I'm not supposed to do this. Have something that promotes something you're not supposed to do. Then I also noticed that it had some false gods on it, and we're not supposed to have any other gods before, the, before God, the Father, and Jesus Christ is God the Father. So there we learn that you, your, quit, your conscience can bear witness in the Holy Ghost. Next we're heading to Romans 13.5, jumping over a few chapters. 13.5, we're going to read 1 through 5 again. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. We're not to take up arms and, oh, we're going to destroy the government. God put people in, in power for a reason. The Old Testament, my servant... Nebuchadnezzar, and it's God talking, saying that Nebuchadnezzar was his servant. He was a heathen. He was a dictator. And they that resisteth shall receive themselves damnation. Okay. For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, 
For he is the minister of God, a revenger for execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Okay. This passage is talking about governments. Um, when they make a law, you're not to murder somebody. And you murder five people, you go to prison, hopefully you can hear the testimony and get saved, but they take you and electrocute you. Oh my gosh, what are they doing? Be afraid. When you do that, but thou do that which is evil, be afraid. Now the other thing I want to point out here before we get into conscience that I noticed... Right here. Uh, verse 3, the last part where it says, Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. When you obey a government, powers it be, that are a terror to evil, you have praise of the Lord, because He put that person in power. Now, when you have a government that's doing, that's a terror to good, because I'm making sure I'm saying this right, they're a terror to good, Right there is where that comes in. Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. This overrides them. God's word overrides them. You do good, and you will still have praise from the Lord. You're not obeying them because they're going against the book. They're now a terror to good, and you'll still have praise from the Lord. But notice it says, but also for conscience sake. Okay. Your conscience not only convicts you, but it's there to keep you. you. I've tried talking to people about this, and you should fear. It's kind of those things. You should fear the chastening of the Lord. People, lost people, should fear God's wrath, and they don't. But as a saved, Bible believing, God fearing man, you're supposed to fear the chastening of the Lord. So, for conscience' sake, listen to your conscience. He's trying to protect you. I'm not saying he, but your conscience is trying to protect you so it doesn't get that far that it requires God chastening you. Okay? I always tell people three steps. Your conscience, you have a chance to convict yourself. Your conscience is going to say, hey, remember what you read? Or you're going to do something wrong and open the Bible and you're going to open it right to where it talks about what you're doing wrong. Your con that's when we get to the Holy Spirit. But your conscience is going to say, hey, that's not right. Something's not right then the Holy Spirit's going to get involved when you open the Bible and it just comes right to what you're doing wrong. And you ignore the Holy Spirit and stay in doing what you're doing wrong, that's when the chastening of the Lord comes. So for conscience sake, listen to your conscience. If you fall into temptation and sin, listen to the Holy Spirit and repent. Fall on your knees, get that repented fast. You should have a fear of the chastisement of the Lord. When it happens, you give thanks to God. Thank you, Lord, for getting me back on the right track. For some reason, I was given into temptation. I was given into my flesh. I wasn't listening to my conscience. I wasn't listening to the Holy Spirit. Thank you for loving me, Lord, and getting me back on the right track. That's the attitude afterwards. Before, you should have fear. Okay. You should fear the chastisement of the Lord. You should do your best not to sin and listen to your conscience. To study this book, read it, and live it, and believe in it. Okay. So, next verse. We were on 13 of Romans. Now we get to 1 Corinthians 8, 7. This is what I did the big study on it, so I'm going to try not to get into it too deep. Uh, if you want to go see the study I did... Uh, what is it? Could the, let's see, could the for, scriptures foresee the teachings of the Trinity? I do, I do an expository study of chapters 1 through, I think, 8. But 1 Corinthians 8, 7 is the verse, but we're going to start at 1. Okay. Chapter 8, I'm on 7. <laughs> let's get over that back. Okay. Start at verse 1. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. We all have knowledge. We all want to know this book and have the Lord show us things in this book. But what happens when you put faith to the side? 
Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Your knowledge overtakes faith, and you don't have you start to lose charity. You stop having charity. Number verse two. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. God's the one, and I kind of screwed this. I was gonna say, who says when you should know something and if you should know something? Verse three. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. God is the one through the Holy Spirit that's going to show you things when He feels you're ready. And there's some things He says you're not supposed to know. The Godhead's one of them. You're not supposed to know how it works. You're, you're, he, he blesses us with letting us know what it is, but we're not supposed to know how it works. Verse 4, As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. I know some people can't get that. For though there be that are called gods, lowercase g, I always give, I always say when they say God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, it's a lowercase g. It's not a capital G because there's only one capital G God, not three. Uh, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. Number six, but there is but one God, the Father, of whom all are all things and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things and we by Him. Verse seven, howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. You know, people keep saying there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's not in everybody that knowledge. For some with conscience of idols unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto idols. And the whole point of that study I did was communion. If you're doing communion to a Jesus that's not God the Father on a cross, He's the Godhead bodily, He's God fully, and you say, no, 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 he, He's separate from God the Father, even though God the Father said that's His blood that was shed on Calvary. Okay, He sacrificed His soul, and Isaiah says it. If you do that, you're doing offerings, um, not offerings, uh, communion to a false god. So you're eating food in remembrance of a false god. Okay. And their conscience being weak is defiled. So here we see that your conscience can be weak, opposed to being good. When the Bible says good, that means in right standing with the Lord and strong. Okay. Here it shows that when you do things that are fleshly, and specifically here it's talking about eating food unto idols, but when you do fleshly, there's things you can do fleshly that you get weak, your conscience becomes weak, and before you know it, you become defiled. And the biggest thing that I can throw at you guys, and brothers out there know what I'm talking about, and maybe some sisters in Christ, but the biggest way is porn. You start out looking at something small. It's something small but you always get more perverted and more perverted and it gets to the point where you went from thinking, ignoring your conscience and doing something that you thought was, uh, I shouldn't have done it, but you know, I went ahead and looked, to the point where you become defiled because you gave into something that's really bad and fleshly. But here, the context is has to do with the food. But we learn that your, your conscience can be weak, become weak, you don't listen to it, you're not supposed to do that and you do it. You're not supposed to do that, and you do it. You're not supposed to do that, and you do it. And I, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that this has to do with lost people. Because before, I believe before a saved Christian's conscience becomes defiled, the Holy Spirit's going to come in. The chastening of the Lord's going to come in. And if you absolutely refuse, God's going to kill you and bring you home early. This is for lost people. Okay. Your conscience will become weak and defiled when you give in to the flesh and ignore your conscience. And while we're here, I remember, I wanted to give the definition of defiled, okay? Because this also could be one that people will think about killing your conscience. You can't kill your conscience. You can defile your conscience. The lost world can. Made dirty or foul, polluted, soiled, 
corrupted. That's the key word. Violated. Okay. Your conscience, when it becomes defiled, becomes corrupt. You don't feel like it's wrong anymore. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay. Uh, verse 8. Because there are a few of these. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered unto idols? Now, conscience here of them that are weak, I believe this is talking when it says, if any man, leaders. You've got these battle buildings, they're worshiping a false god, the Trinity, they're promoting a false gospel, only believe. Um, and people come in there newly saved and they get deceived by that really quick. Their conscience becomes weak, they don't know better until somebody comes up and explains to them. But most often times, their conscience gets so weak and defiled, you have false converts. And this is why I'm getting back to the false converts. They're so weak and defiled, when you try to show them truth, they don't want to hear it. They don't want nothing to do with it. Remember, you start doing videos, doing any teaching, anything, addressing the body of Christ to lift them up, and you're going to do it on a weekly basis, God holds you to a higher standard. Teachers, preachers, pastors, elders, which I call deacons. Okay? They hold you, God holds you to a higher accountability. Okay? You are causing people's consciences to become weak and defiled when you teach a false gospel and get them to worship a false god, the Trinity. Number 11, verse 11. And through the knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Okay. You can become weak, like I said, and your conscience can convict you, the Holy Spirit will convict you, because your conscience will bear witness in the Holy Spirit. It's almost like the Holy Spirit says, you're not supposed to do that, and your conscience goes, I told him. He wouldn't listen to me, I told him. Your conscience bears witness in the Holy Ghost. You ignore the Holy Ghost, God comes, gets involved big time and chastens your life. You ignore the chastening right here. Who shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? Okay. God will kill you and take you home early. And you'll miss out on a lot of rewards. Number 12, but when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. You have these leaders saying, okay, the Trinity is great, we're not giving up the Trinity, and let's give communion to the Trinity. Okay, they've sinned against Christ himself. Uh, wherefore, if meat... Are we supposed to go all the way to 13? Yeah. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh, while the world slandereth, lest I make my brother to offend. And we'll get a little bit later that explains that a little bit more. But the whole point here is... You eat food offered to idols. If you're doing communion to the Trinity and you flat out reject the Godhead, you're worshiping a false god. And when you do communion, you're eating food offered to idols. And your conscience is going to become weak. And it will get weak to the point of being defiled. You need to get saved. Most often times when people stand for the Trinity, it's these people that are for the easy believism. I don't have to repent. I don't have to be sorry for my sins. I don't have to give up my sins after salvation. There's, I don't have to be sanctified. I don't have to clean up my life after I'm saved. Those are the people that believe in the Trinity. They're lost. Okay. You need to get saved. So we learn here that your conscience can be weak, the opposite of good, every time the Bible says so far, that you're conscient, in a good conscience, that means it's right with the Lord, and it's strong. Here it's shown the opposite of strong, which is weak. And if it gets too weak, it becomes defiled. Okay. 
And at that point, I just believe that if your conscience can get so bad that it becomes defiled, you're not saved because the Holy Spirit should have came in and convicted you. There should be chastening in your life. If it gets so bad, God will love you enough to kill you and bring you home early.